Today's episode is brought to you by Media for All, which was set up to help encourage more black, Asian and other ethnic talent into media and to provide a support and mentoring network to ensure talent flourishes in the media industry that we all love. If you're looking for a mentor or would like to mentor young ethnic talent, check them out at mediaforall.org.uk and it is all 100% free. Hello and welcome to the Shiny New Object podcast. My name is Tom Ollerton. I'm the founder of Automated Creative and this is a podcast about the future of marketing. Every week or so I have the pleasure and the privilege to interview one of our industry's leaders and this week is no different. I'm on a call with Lee Radford who is Senior Vice President General Manager at Procter & Gamble Ventures. Lee, thanks so much for joining the show. It would be fantastic if you could give the audience an overview of who you are and what you do. Great. Hi, Tom. It's great to be here. So it's a pleasure. So yes, uh, I, my name is Lee Radford and I uh, lead P&G Ventures. And P&G Ventures is a startup studio within Procter & Gamble uh, with the, the total goal of creating new billion dollar brands for the company. But a long-term marketer, I've been with uh, the company, you know, 29 years and have loved marketing from day one and uh, continuing to just uh, make great things happen for consumers by bringing great new brands into their lives. So I can imagine that P&G Ventures is probably the coolest bit of P&G. How did you end up getting into that part of the business? You know, I think it is the coolest part of P&G. And... You know, I got into it around five years ago, and a former CEO of the company had asked me uh, to consider coming in and, you know, helping our innovation engine and creating new brands for the company. And, you know, my, my career was in general management and marketing within the company, um, but every brand I used to work on, Global Olay Skincare, Global VIX, Respiratory, I always created brands within my brands. On, uh, on VIX, I created the Zequel brand, so took our, our really, you know, wonderful NyQuil brand and took it into Zequil. On Olay, really started building that into a higher-end mystique business with the introduction of Regenerous. So I'm just a natural brand creator, and when the company came calling looking for some help in creating new brands, new categories, uh, they asked me to consider and, and build up what needed to happen to make that a reality. And P&G Ventures was born. So I kind of call myself the founder of P&G Ventures. <laughs> Brilliant. And so what, in, in that last five years in, in the new role, what have been the new beliefs or behaviors that have really helped you do your job? Yeah, you know, the belief, the number one belief I, I really, you know, follow is the, the area of trust. And that's, you know, trusting yourself, trusting your gut, trusting the consumer, trusting the people that work for you. Uh, I knew I had to change some of the culture. And the culture is great when we're managing billion dollar businesses. And that's why P&G has been around over 180 years. But when you're looking to start operating as a startup and finding new ways to partner with entrepreneurs, we knew there had to be an adjustment in how we got the work done. So a lot of things I needed were, were folks who I could trust and trust their gut and trust their instinct to make things happen in different ways, being able to push the boundaries where boundaries needed to be pushed. And you know, I keep coming back to that, that one word because I think that's what made ventures take off in the way it did. It's, it's really taking the right people and trusting them to, to do what they do best. And uh, that's how the, the whole business was created. So how do you decide when to trust someone and when not to trust someone? You know, I was really fortunate because, well, I always start with trust uh, regardless. And, but I was really fortunate to be able to handpick some really top leaders to come into uh, the organization. You know, leaders that I knew were amazing marketers, leaders that were amazing formulators, uh, from R&D, research and development, and consumer research, and I was able to really pull together an A-team. So I was fortunate to know uh, some of the folks I, I put around me, and I always try to find people that are different and complementary to my own skills. 
And so it's really over years of building that trust and giving people room to fly and do what they do best. Uh, but I always find it's, it's part of risk taking, I think, with any you know, leadership role. You, know, you embed the trust and you know, when you give it, they give it back. It's always worked for me. And so in that career, like what are the sort of biggest risks you've taken and, and what are the biggest mistakes as opposed to uh, associated with those risks? Where's it, where's it unraveled? When's it gone wrong? And what have you learned from that? You know, probably the biggest risk I've taken in my career are always taking the high risk options. You know, I graduated from University of Florida and had multiple job offers and I ended up taking a job with the airlines, Eastern Airlines, which is no longer in existence it's now you know formulated into united uh, but it was a high risk scenario uh, we knew that that company was almost on the brink of bankruptcy but i i wanted that industry and i wanted that experience and i took that risk and it was probably the best risk of my career uh, png was not a risk but in the type of jobs i've taken within png i would say that there'd be higher risk jobs within png the ventures was one you know, a lot of people come to P&G to run billion dollar businesses, and so did I, and I've had the privilege of doing that. Uh, and then when ventures came along, it was, it was, you know, perceived as a little riskier because that is not necessarily the heart of what P&G is known for. And uh, it was, again, a best decision. I've always, I've always gone to those paths that tended to have a little more of a creative slant in business. A creative slant in business and they tended to be a little more risky so if someone's listening to this podcast mm. thinking i'm not much of a risk taker doesn't feel comfortable what tactics or tips would you encourage them to use in order to become more of a risk taker and open up bigger opportunities it's really um, look into themselves and look in the confidence they have in themselves and what they truly enjoy doing. I'm a firm believer that you will always um, be more successful in things you love to do. And sometimes the things you love to do is not the path that everybody takes. And, you know, have, have confidence in yourself, have faith in yourself that you know, you know that you will be the top 1% on that different path versus maybe the middle of a broader path. Uh, it's just really following your gut. I followed my gut most of my career. I followed my passion most of my career. And uh, that's what I would tell others to do as well. I know it's hard uh, when, when it seems like everyone goes one path and you may, may choose another. But I think that's kind of the joy of, of of marketing in particular, it's being able to find those opportunities on the edges um, to break through. So when do you know that you're not following your gut? You don't feel good. You know, you, when you don't, <laughs> <laughs> you really don't, when you don't follow your gut, it's, it's your, it's, uh, you, you just know it. It's that feeling that, wow, um, this does not feel right. And, you know, the suggestion I give to folks when that's the case, you can, you can experiment with everything. You just need to know what, what the risk is of those experiments. And so sometimes you, you, your guts may say something and, and maybe somebody in your team is really pushing for another way. And I'm, um, you know, I'm not 100% right. You know, I follow my gut a lot and, you know, it's, it's treated me well over my career, but I'm always open to other people's opinions and other people's way. And sometimes I just hold that gut in and use data to help us make the decision, which is so great in a digital world, right? Because, you know, you can test a lot of ideas with, you know, very little risk and very quickly. That, that's not how it used to be. A lot of times when you're making some big marketing decisions, you didn't have that ability to quickly test and iterate. Now, I think you can even loosen your gut a little bit because uh, the risk is lower and you can easily get data and course correct and, and maybe surprise yourself sometimes. And I have, I, I've surprised myself. Uh, sometimes my gut isn't always right and, and trusting it goes back to the trust of others and new ideas. So the, so the flip side of, all those opportunities that you talk about is taking on too much. So how do you 
become better at saying no to things when there's so many options from a for a marketer on, from a digital perspective these days you know it's very interesting when i started adventures uh one of the the advice that i was given yeah you know, i didn't really know the startup world and uh it's a very generous community which i've loved getting to know and when I say generous, uh, they always open for a coffee, always open for a conversation. And early on, I said yes to every one of those opportunities because I needed to say yes to those. I needed to understand, you know, that that community and that that process and, and those individuals and how this new world of business was uh, and the community was, you know, coming to be. Uh, and you realize you just cannot say yes all the time. And to the point where I felt like I was full, I got what I needed. Uh, I just slowed that down a lot. And that, and that was hard because you're saying no. And you know that every conversation will make you stronger and will help you, you know, finish the puzzle. And, um, but probably the best advice is you do have to say no. And that's just one example. Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a mother, you know, twin boys, family, and, you know, um, and a very busy job. And it's all about priority, you know, setting and, and saying no to those things that, um, you know, aren't, they don't hit your priority list. And you wish they could, but they just, they just can't. So the best, best, best thing is continue to practice saying no and also rely on someone around you who can, continue to remind you to say no. And I have a great assistant who's been by my side for many years. And she is one that helps me with my calendar and questions when I should be, uh, you know, pushing back even a little further. So sometimes it takes, uh, you know, you know, wow. takes a I've, team. I've never met a person who's got a no person on there. Oh, on I do. I highly recommend it. <laughs> I highly recommend it. Right, I'm gonna I'm gonna remember that uh, for when I ask that question in the future. Do you have a no person? So imagine you're a student and you have graduated. You're smart. You're driven. You're doing all of the basics really well. But what advice would you give to that smart, driven student who wants to get ahead in this business? The biggest advice I would give is to start your story. I am a firm believer that everything builds on everything else. And early on, when I see some of these, you know, students come in, you know, at P&G or just, you know, broadly who I mentor, you know, outside of work, you know, they start early and they, they follow their passion and they try to find jobs, even if they're not in paying jobs that may go alongside a needed paying job that just starts to have them play um, in the marketing or public relations or communication space that just gives them exposure, that gives them a story that can be built upon. Because then the next opportunity comes, they have a story to tell and, and a little experience that will build into the next experience. And then that experience moves into the next. I do believe it's never too young to start your story and building and forming your career towards your passion. And any experience uh, matters. It's all what you, you know, put into it and try to pull out of it. And that's, that's a pretty, that's the biggest advice. I think things are a lot more competitive these days. And so having your story, you know, having your, um, your experiences that you can bring to the table, uh, I think will set them ahead of those who may not have a story to tell. And how would you help people understand what their story is? Because it would be fair to think that someone who's just left university might not know what that is, or they might be interested in lots of things. They might feel they want to be in marketing, but they might also want to be in different elements of media. But it, do you need to have that story at the start, or do you think there's any merit to take your hands off the wheel and see what happens? Yeah, I think there's merit, but I do believe probably those individuals, even if they were to surround themselves with a few areas of interest, if it's you know media or communications, marketing, digital, uh, all those are interlinked, but they're all in the same broad field. And uh, I I think when and I think that goes back to your passion. You kind of know what you enjoy doing. You know the type of classes you've always gravitated to. You know the ones that you love to show up and those that you're just showing up. And it listens to your gut. Uh, I think uh, 
folks know very early in, in, their, in their lives where their passion sits. And I think that gravitates to the type of school and the type of classes and, uh, and where, where, what makes them happy. And so I would say try a lot of different things, but you can still weave a story in, in, in those different experiences because they all kind of gravitate to what you're passionate about. If you love all things innovation and want to understand how brands plan to emerge stronger from the current situation, don't forget to check out Madfest London on the 11th and 12th of November. My good friend Dan at Madfest knows how to put on a cracking event and there's always plenty of amazing speakers, beer and cool people to meet. Check it out at www.madfestlondon.com. So we're at the halfway stage now, and we're going to talk about your shiny new object, which we've never had before on the podcast, which is, somewhat unsurprisingly, launching new billion-dollar brands, which is massive, brilliant. It makes me smile just selling, just saying that. So what what does that mean? I know you explained a bit about your, your job, but can you help the audience understand from a very top level how P&G launches a new billion dollar brand? I would love to. So I am so fortunate to work at a, at a company such as P&G where we have amazing brands that, you know, have, you know, built on superiority that matters, that consumers over many years, 50 years, 100 years, have entrusted into their lives, into their homes. And when you get it right, you know that you're building a legacy brand. And it's all about the fundamental truths of, you know, what you're pulling together, listening to consumers, trusting consumers and building a brand to do so. You know, in my career, I've, I've worked on many billion dollar brands, you know, Crest Toothpaste, also Oral-B, you know, Vicks, we've talked about, Olay, uh, even Ivory, which was one of the original, uh, you know, brands of P&G, not a billion dollar brand, but uh, one of the originals. And you learn from all those experiences, but most of those is that it, it builds brands that matter. And, you know, P&G Ventures is, you know, it's very clear our mission statement is to build the next billion dollar brand for the company, you know, with uh, proven superiority that consumers notice, uh, trying to make their lives a little better um, in any way we can. And so in building ventures and building these brands, it goes it really goes to the fundamentals of what it takes to create a great brand. And that puts the consumer in the center and really understanding the problem to solve. And so, so does it always start with direct consumer research? So we're looking at, I don't know, mom or students or you know, older people or, or whatever it is, and then asking them, saying, well, you know, what, what is the frustration? Is it, are you trying to solve a problem that no product solves or you or would you look in a specific category? How, how do you cast the net? Where does the process start? Great question. You know, a lot of times consumers can't tell you what they, what they need and uh, they're unarticulated what they desire. And so uh, we always start with where the, you know, the puck is going, where the wind is blowing, what are the trends, the broad, broad socioeconomic trend, trends. And that really starts with where are the consumer trends going? You know, aging, you know, aging consumers, millennials, um, the rising uh, middle class in China. We do know that that is, has a lot of, you know, tailwind. And so you always want to build brands knowing where the future is going. So making sure you understand the broad, you know, micro, you know, macro climate um, in the world that you live in. Uh, the other is besides who's consuming, is how they're consuming. You know, consumers today are consuming very differently than, you know, 10, 15 years ago. They're consuming more digital, the more sustainable and green uh, mindset. Uh, they, you know, um, they want transparency in, in the, the brands that they choose. So by combining both who those consumers are and how they're consuming and where those intersections are, that is creating new jobs to be done, is where new brands are formed. So we do a lot of research. We focus more, you know, primarily on US and China for the venture team. 
and really talk to a lot of consumers and understand because of these collisions and who the consumers are and how they're consuming and you know what their needs are and where they're living you realize there's a lot of unmet jobs that aren't being covered by categories today and that's what's really fascinating with our work it's this is not about creating the next shampoo or the next uh, deodorant this is about creating new to the world brands that didn't exist that are solving problems consumers didn't even know uh, that they had, um, but based on looking at their actions and seeing how they are living, it was clearly obvious there was a job to be done. And so is it always discussions with consumers directly? Is it in focus groups in person? Or are you combining things like social listening? Or is there, or is there another form of data that you use to, to spot that insight? Yeah, it mainly does start with the consumer and really listening, but you do follow trends. I mean, one of the things that, um, you know, I do personally and a lot of my folks in my team is we try to connect the dots. We tend to, to really make sure we're staying in touch with all the trends that are around us. But, you know, we use a lot of the digital tools now to really engage with consumers at a level that we never were able to 15 years ago. I always say that it would be very hard as a marketer to go back and create billion dollar businesses when the, you know, the digital uh, ability to test ideas very rapidly and co-create consumers are now, is now at our, our doorstep. Uh, so it's, it's been delight. So most of the work we do by talking and listening to consumers and, and seeing how they, they live and how they act and the decisions they make. What do they fire? What do they hire? You know, what are those tensions in their lives? But most of it does come from the consumer and knowing the broader environment in which they live. And so when you're looking at these new trends, what is the most recent trend where you've really raised your eyebrows and, and thought, oh, wow, really? Is that a thing? You know, the one that uh, I keep watching is uh, the role of connectivity. You know, it seems like everything is connected these days. And, you know, I just renovated my kitchen and I think every, everything from the toaster is connected. And no, you know, I'll be tell curious. Me, tell to me you don't have a smartphone. Uh, tell me you don't. And, I, and, I, and so I, I'm wondering where that's going to go. I really am because uh, it's almost expected, but not quite used. I don't think the adaption is, is um, adoption is where, um, you know, it's going to end up. So I find that fascinating. And we're learning, um, learning every day on that one. We just introduced a new uh, skin device, uh, which, you know, um, is connected, but uh, we're looking to take it to that next level. And just learning from consumers, what does that mean? And what are they willing to do to make sure a it is connected and and you know what type of investment they'll put into to make that happen uh, but that is one i think the area that i find fascinating also is the transparency of brands you know sustainability has been around for a while i don't you know i don't think anyone is doing it um, to the degree that i think we all hope and or what we believe is the possible possibilities there uh, but I think it's just the transparency and also in digital where everything is at the fingertips of consumers. I like that. Um, I think that's where we have an advantage because of the type of decisions we make every day and the brands that we, you know, put in front of consumers. Uh, but I find that really fascinating of how that is evolving and, you know, putting that in the consumer's hands. And so help me understand the scale so how many tests do you do a year how many brands do you launch presumably you have some that are just working at a conceptual level and some of those won't make it through but then someone will some will get made and brands designed so like do you have a goal is it like right we want to get one billion dollar brand a year or 10 or 100 or like how does it work how what's the process to filtering through from spotting the trend spotting the opportunity to to getting things on the shelves yeah, uh, you know, we have a portfolio, and as you know, with any innovation, you have a lot of failures early on, and the objective is to ensure that all those failures happen early, not later in the funnel. <laughs> but in any given time, we would have you know, 15 to 20 different you know, brand problems that we're trying to solve and matching with technologies to solve them. 
And, and that's probably the hardest is to really find technologies that show noticeable differences that we know can be built into legacy brands. So that's where a lot of our effort is. And, uh, you know, at any given time, we could be looking at hundreds. Uh, but, you know, we, we, we funnel it down pretty quickly and, and validates technologies in the spaces. But we also know early on that we're in a big place um, to play. If we don't believe that the, the need and problem has billion dollar potential, we're, 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 we're very quick to walk away. So we do a lot of size of prize um, work early on to just really know, you know, what the potential of these businesses are. Uh, and then uh, looking for the right technologies. But, you know, you know, we've launched four businesses in the, you know, the five years that we've been around. We're thrilled with that. You know, different levels and, and different degrees and different approaches. Uh, one thing I love about ventures, there's not one way to launch a brand these days. Uh, it all depends what, again, what, what service you're offering or what problem. Some are subscription brands that, that fit better in a direct-to-consumer world. And others are just, you know, brands that are really better just to, uh, you know, play on the retail shelf. You know, and there's a lot of hybrid in between. So, you know, we have four in the market today and, and we like that. We, you know, you know, we hope they all make it to the next stage, but we're continuing to fuel the back end of the funnel to uh, bring the next set of cohorts to life. And which are the billion dollar brands that you didn't launch that you wish you did? None, none. Um, one thing that, yeah, I think myself and my team are fairly confident when we, when we kill something, you got to let go. Yeah. And uh, what I love about portfolio, when you have a real robust portfolio, it's easier to let go because you have better options to choose from. So uh, it's very rare that I wish we had done something different or, you know, it doesn't mean if something changes in the world that would reopen that consideration. But when we, we kill it, we, we move on and, you know, we work on the next big idea that, you know, we're anxious to, to get our hands on. So it reminds me of a conversation with a, a previous podcast guest. He said you, you spend far more time regretting things you said yes to than the things you said no to. Because if you've chosen the wrong yes, then it kind of you've said yes, so it sort of sticks with you, and it gets worse and worse and worse. Whereas a no, you could just kill it off at the start. You know then, that that you that is true. Uh, that is true. I, I'm lucky that we are not in that situation today. But I will say that there there has been times in my career that you just kind of have to see it through or quickly pivot and <laughs> and move on. So, so you're in this unique position of leading p g ventures but a lot of people who listen to this podcast don't work for massive massive companies and not work for smaller companies and they might be listening to this thinking oh what i would do to have the the budget and the resources to to not even launch a billion dollar brand but to launch a hundred billion dollar brand or you know or even you know a, a fraction of that if you were working elsewhere and you were working for a, a smaller business, but yet you still had to kind of launch new brands, what, what would you do? And what advice could you give to people who don't have your resources and experience if they also wanted to launch new brands? Yeah. Well, one thing I had mentioned that I, I love about my job is how much we work with startups around the world and entrepreneurs and inventors. Uh, I do believe the next billion dollar business out of P&G will come from a partnership of an entrepreneur and P&G in combining the best of both worlds. So I have loved going um, headfirst into the entrepreneur world and, you know, it has made me a better manager and it's bringing better, you know, even stronger propositions to our portfolio. So uh, I have a lot of uh, energy to help entrepreneurs and startups. I, I do believe that there is a big, an equal playing field uh, where sometimes resources, you know, um, are less of a differentiator because of the low cost to get in on, especially on the digital mediums and being able to test and validate ideas that then allow you to, to find funding or partnerships. Uh, so 
I think uh, being very scrappy is an amazing attribute of entrepreneurs where they have no limitations and that is one of their strengths that they, they can just keep going because they don't have those limitations to create these, these amazing businesses that I know, you know P&G and other companies are very interested in. And the same for the entrepreneurs and all those inventors out there who are sitting on some ideas and thoughts. And uh, there's so many innovation challenges and things these days that allow entrepreneurs to get more visible. And that, you know, one thing I, I always try to make sure people know is that there's multiple ways to partner. You know, before VCs were, uh, you know, the lead way and a very good option for many, many entrepreneurs. But there's now, you know, companies like P&G and others that are looking to partner in unique and different ways to help uh, entrepreneurs with P&G create that next billion dollar brand. Well, Lee, I'm gutted to say that this is the end of the podcast. It's been such a treat to chat to you and, and get an insight into how you do what you do. If there was an entrepreneur or an inventor who heard this and thought, I need to get this thing in front of Lee, how would you want them to do that? Yeah, um, we are open for business uh, and we have our website, you know, PNG Ventures uh, Studio .com, and we have an open portal for hearing new ideas. We also host many innovation challenges. One of our largest is one is at the CES uh, show that we were, we've had two years running uh, and we've had a couple of virtual ones as well. So yeah, we're very clear with the type of businesses we're looking for. And I, I encourage them to look at our site and see if there is a potential match for a partnership to happen. Brilliant. Thank you so much for your time, Lane. It was such a pleasure, Tom. Have a great day. Hi, just before you go, I'd really appreciate it if you could take the time to write a review of the Shiny New Object podcast on Apple Podcasts or iTunes, or whatever it's called these days, or whichever podcast provider you use. We're an indie podcast, so it would go a long way for us if you could just share the word and give us a bit of a support on those channels. That would just be fantastic. If you haven't got time, that's also cool. And yeah, if you could tell your colleagues about the podcast and also, if possible, don't forget to subscribe. And I'd love to hear your feedback. Uh, if you'd like to speak on the podcast or be a guest or you think I'm asking the wrong questions, anything, I'd be super interested to hear what you think. So please email me at tom at automatedcreative.net. That's T-O-M at, uh, I'm not going to bother spelling it. Anyway, you'll work it out. Thanks so much.